Hello and welcome back. My guest today is Jean Fowler, who was the founding district manager with her husband of the Pagan Federation in this region of Scotland in Edinburgh and the Lothians. Welcome, Jean. It's nice to see you. Thank you, Joe. And it's nice to be here. Jean is also a fellow trustee with myself of the Edinburgh Interfaith Association. And I was wondering if we might start by talking about how the pagans do connect with other faiths. Mm -hmm. You mentioned to me earlier about how you started in the Church of Scotland tradition and then you moved to paganism. Tell me a little bit about how you connect with other religions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, to, to be honest with you, there are, there are Christian pagans and there are Jewish pagans. Um, so there's, there's not, you know, the, 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 um, there's no boundaries there really within things. Um, the Pagan Federation itself sort of likes to promote this um, harmony within other belief systems mm -hmm. as well. We like to, we like to, um, you know, tell people about paganism, explain it. Um, we've done so and, and we, we take, place, take part in interviews like this or we, we give talks, um, all sorts of different platforms really to bring an awareness of paganism and to kind of across boundaries as it were. So you do a lot of work with uh, providing information and education. Do you do any work in the schools with the RME program? Not particularly, no, but I'm actually part of the university. I'm an honorary pagan um, chaplain there at Edinburgh University. Um, so I'm involved with students quite a lot. Um, and do we have many students who practice the pagan faith or have shown interest in it at Edinburgh? It's difficult. It's difficult actually keeping track of them. I mean, like pagans, it, you know, organizing pagans is very much like herding cats. <laughs> so you, you saw find yourself up against, you know, what I do is if, if, if the, you know, I put myself out there to be known to the students, etc. And uh, if anyone you know, wants to network, there are, there are various meetings and moots and things throughout Edinburgh that people can go to and uh, various groups. So I try to kind of uh, network and also support things. I've also been involved in helping students with research and, and so on about the pagan path and, and comparis, you know, comparative religions. Interesting, because Edinburgh, as we all know, has a world-renowned school of divinity, mm -hmm. and it's wonderful to see that students are interested in paganism as well. Let me ask you this. Earlier, you told me a little bit about some of the rites and rituals that occur at a pagan wedding. Are there other pagan ritual ceremonies that take place during the calendar year? Yes, well, we've, we have what we call the Wheel of the Year. So it's basically eight festivals. Um, usually... Walk me through those. Um, well, I've tried to... <laughs> I don't want to slip up here. Um, basically, it starts at, at Samhain or Halloween. Um, then we have Winter Solstice. Um, then we have Imolk or Candlemas, as it relates to the Christian calendar. Um, then we have a Vernal Equinox. Um, so sort of springtime, um, then Beltane, then summer solstice, Lammas, where it's, it's sort of the beginning of harvest, and that's it's the sort of end of July, beginning of August, um, autumnal equinox, um, and back to Samhain again. And so that's... Well, you really have a full year then of celebrations. It's similar mm -hmm. to my faith, the Jewish people, you know, starting with Rosh Hashanah, the new year in uh, the autumn, and then going all the way through the, the year with our various festivals. Where do pagans meet to practice their faith? Do they meet individually? Do you meet collectively? What would I experience if I wanted to attend a pagan celebration? Well, I mean, a lot of pagans like to meet outdoors, but in Scotland, that's not always practical. Um, so a lot meet indoors. Um, we don't have like temples, churches or anything like that, a formal building where we meet. So it tends to be in people's homes. So at this time, it's, it's quite catastrophic for pagans because they're not able to, to meet up because of all the regulations and so on. 
That's cool. And do you have do you have a regular weekly period of worship as they do in the Christian tradition or the Jewish tradition, the Sabbath? Um, not particularly, no. Um, we the, you can have sort of like monthly some um, a lot of pagans have like monthly ceremonies and that tie in with the, the cycles of the moon um, and on practical levels a lot of pagans like to meet up once a month and um, so that's where we have like moots and, and meetings and things but they tend to be either in like a little hub somewhere or you know coffee shop or a, a pub even or or something like that um, <clears throat> so that's that's kind of a, again that's kind of curtailed so we're having to be a bit more inventive at the moment um, and using Zoom and things too. Of course. And let me ask you this, in the pagan tradition, is there a celebrant or someone who leads these meetings in the coffee shop or on Zoom? Or how, what's the structure of the program? How is it led? Well, I mean, a lot of the meetings are, are basically about talks and, and discussions about pagan subjects and, and so on. Um, but you have sort of like bigger rituals and things that, that, that are performed. Um, so there's generally one or two people leading that. Um, but usually everyone's in a circle, so there isn't really such a hierarchy there. Mm -hmm. But it does take a slight, you know, you have to have a structure. So you have people leading that and we have um, other people who are perhaps the, the officers of the, the element, elemental officers who mm -hmm. welcome the elements to, um, to actually guard and, and look after the, the circle. And the four elements are, would you remind us of that please? Um, air, fire, water and earth. Interesting. So it's very similar in some ways to the Quaker faith in that it's um, a shared tradition. In other words, you're sitting in a circle and you might have a couple of folks providing structure and a topic, but it's really shared in a communal way. What if someone, you mentioned the challenges you're having during the pandemic, what if one of your members has an experience with depression or needs help from people in the pagan faith community? How is that organized? Um, well, Myself, I'm actually I'm actually studying um, counselling at the moment. So, it, and quite often, if small groups of people, there are people who have, are leading the group who are sensitive to the needs of others, um, and and quite often it leads them into a path such as I've taken um, into counselling and listening and and so forth. Um, so there is guidance, you know, there are people there that can, can support each other. I mean, pagans tend to generally support each other mm. in lots of ways in any case. Um, but again, obviously, if it's more serious, then you, know, you would advise or help someone to seek medical or, or professional help. Yes. It seems to me, as we think about the values of the pagan community, that you might just be the greenest of all contemporary religions because of your connection to the earth. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, I mean, pagans basically believe that everything is sacred. I mean, even inanimate objects, rocks, stones, mm. the whole, you know, so basically the, the planet, the solar system, as far as you want to, to take it, is all, is all sacred to us, really, so that we wouldn't, we wouldn't harm another person, so we wouldn't harm the, the planet and we've got a sort of as as above so below method that what you know you if you it's a kind of I suppose as you reap so shall you sow um that we we would we have a positive morality on that mm. that these issues too it's very similar to the Native American mm. belief you know that you are stewards of the earth mm, you know, that you're protecting the earth for the next seven generations or so yeah, we, we, we'd like to try and get that message out to other other people too. And I suppose it's it's nice to collectively join in things like inter, interfaith and, and so on that want to, to sort of um, help the earth in all sorts of ways. Well, that's interesting because as we've talked about before, unfortunately, with some religious traditions, 
there are negative connotations and your people have certainly suffered with the witch trials and the, the loss of 2,500 witches in the city of Edinburgh. <clears throat> what is being done within the pagan federation to help get this positive message out that you're talking about? Um, well, as I said earlier on, the, the Pagan Federation itself is it, its its whole um, reason for existence was anti-defamation. Um, so there are people who are more specialised than perhaps myself who can uh, reach the, 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 the necessary um, higher echelons, I suppose, mm -hmm. to influence that. Although I have taken, I, I did become a, a community councillor myself for a little while, um, but we didn't really touch on pagan issues at that right. point. But then it gives you a little insight into how politics work and, and yeah. how um, there's a network there as well that you can you can reach out to. Yes, you know, before the parliament now there is hate crime legislation mm -hmm. that for some is quite controversial because they believe that it may. Uh, jeopardize freedom of speech, etc. What's the thinking in the Pagan Federation about this new hate crime uh, legislation and its potential for helping reduce hate crime in Scotland? Mm -hmm. Well, we definitely welcome it. Um, there's, there's no doubt about that. I mean, we've campaigned on a lot of issues um, ourselves and you know, it's having more clout as it were behind us and support is, is definitely a good thing. Yes. Speaking of um, positive uh, messaging by the Pagan Federation, I want to direct our viewers and listeners to your website, which I found very, very robust with information about the history of paganism and your traditions and your current work that you're doing here. And that's at www.scottish P for pagan, F for federation.org, www.scottishpf.org. Let's talk about probably your most visible event of the year, which is, of course, the Beltane Festival that takes place on top of Calton Hill. I believe it begins with folk in the morning dew at the top of Arthur's Seat, because I stay near Arthur's Seat, and I'll never forget my first year in Scotland 15 years ago. On May the 1st, I went to catch the bus for the university and several people painted in blue <laughs> were descending Arthur's seat and walking towards me. It was quite mystical and magical. How did the Beltane Festival all come about and how is it celebrated today? Um, I mean, what the, the big pagan, the big, sorry, the Beltane event that happens in Edinburgh um, I think it started in about the 80s. I can't, I can't remember exactly. I mean, I'm, I'm not directly connected with it, but there is a Beltane Fire Society who are connected with that. And I believe actually two ex-students of Edinburgh University um, were the May Queen and the, the Green Man in the festival um, last year and the year before. Um, but it's it, it kind of, I think it's a, a pageant more than anything, because when you you can do things with a few people, but it's quite small and intense. Mm -hmm. But when you're involving audiences, then it has to be like a play in a way. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's good. It's a good spectacle in a way, and it, it sort of engages people with the spirit of Beltane. I think in a very a very positive way. Mm -hmm. And what's the tradition on the top of Arthur's Seat with the dew and and so on? Is that part of the pagan tradition as well? I know that's been going on for time since before I was a pagan, I think, um, definitely. But I remember as a child, even my, my, my father and sort of encouraging me, it was like old Scottish folk tales, really. You go out and you, you wash your face in the dew and uh, you remain young and beautiful forever. So I think oh, <laughs> lovely. Do more than that, I think. <laughs> I love all our Scottish traditions. Being an American who became Scottish 15 years ago when I became a, a, a citizen here, when I ask people the origin of these traditions, if you ask three people, you get five different answers. 
you know? <laughs> it's very difficult to find some historical mm -hmm. uh, accuracy, but it's wonderful to hear about these great traditions. Let's talk for a moment about the tragedy of the witch trials that happened in Scotland many centuries ago. To my sadness, there is only a small memorial to these women who died uh, near Edinburgh Castle. What are some of the aspirations in the Pagan Federation in terms of recognizing these souls in the future? Yeah, well, I mean, already there is a, another a fairly new memorial in Orkney um, for witches who were persecuted there, or what people who were persecuted as witches, I should say. Um, and obviously, we do we do try to sort of um, promote that you know these sort of things. If we if we find something, we will try and raise funds for it, and we will work with the local communities to try and raise awareness and to even have a monument placed there, if we can. Have there been, for example, public programs or education programs? perhaps with speakers like Claire Mitchell QC at Edinburgh's Compass Chambers, who's leading the effort to provide recognition for these, these women. Are there programs throughout the year that uh, raise the understanding level about this period in our history? Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly we, at the, the Pain Foundation has an annual conference where we invite a lot of speakers and we have had quite eminent speakers from the university talk about these issues um, so we do obviously try to, to, to promote that as much as we can. Um, I, I, I took part in a, a thing at, uh, in Stirling, it was about witchcraft myself and there were a few um, professors and, and archaeologists there which was, was very interesting. You didn't let any professors in the room did you? <laughs> we did indeed. Oh my goodness. I can't my my last question is, so often we think of the pagan religion, we think of the earth, and we think not always uh, of the light and bright side, the joyful part of being a pagan. Mm -hmm. Tell me about some of the joy that comes from the pagan faith. I mean, I suppose pagans embrace the dark as well as the light, but not in a, a, a sinister, not, you know, not dark is evil and, and, and light is good, but that they work in harmony. It's a bit like the yin yang, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, so it, it all means, it, it's all important to us and all encompassed within us, I suppose. So nature, I suppose, it, it's, we, we can see it all around us, we can feel it. Um, it just, it, it manifests itself to us in so many ways. Um, that pagans, you know, it's a natural thing, I suppose, a natural progression for pagans to celebrate and to, to honor the earth. I love this because it reminds me of what you said earlier about the eight festivals, the eight cycles of the year, that it is indeed the cycle of life that you celebrate, the light times as well as the dark times. You give respect and honor to both the yin and the yang, you know, of life. Yeah. Thank you for respecting the values of Interfaith Scotland by sharing your wonderful traditions and long history uh, of paganism in Scotland and in the world with us today. And I hope that the pagan people in Scotland and beyond grow from strength to strength. Thanks, Jean. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.